Good evening, everybody. Welcome to this really special um, Crohn's and Colitis UK Facebook Live. Um, it's a chance for some questions and answers to you, but we're doing it today because it's International Nurses Day. It's also Florence Nightingale's 200th birthday, so it's a big one for us today. And I'm so delighted to have with us a group of five, actually, of your Crohn's and Colitis UK nurse specialists who are working with us at the charity through our nursing programme. So we're going to have a good chat. We're going to talk through stuff which I hope will be useful to you about how we work and what we do. And then we've got some questions from you that the comms team have gathered already, and you'll have a chance to send us some questions towards the end. If there's things you want to ask nurse specialists, here we are. Um, and it's a really good chance for you to see really how fantastically nurse specialists are working across the UK to support you. So we've got five individuals here. Can I ask you all just to go around and introduce yourself? I'm going to name you just so um, so we do it one at a time. Vida, can you go first? Hi, yeah, I'm, I'm Vida. I'm um, down in Exeter in Devon um, in Southwest. And Vida, what, what, what's your official title at work? I'm lead nurse for IBD. Okay, and uh, Exeter looks particularly sunny from here. It is, it's beautiful weather down here. <laughs> Sorry, my son just walked in the room. <laughs> <laughs> well, now, I'll let you off then. Pearl, are you there? Do you want to I'm introduce here. yourself? Hi, I'm Pearl. Um, Pearl Avery from Danny Dorset. I'm a neighbour uh, Vida. Um, I'm currently um, actually on secondment from my trust, working um, with the IBD registry for a little while. So, um, so a little bit different for me, but I'm still in sunny Dorset, which is still lovely. Thanks, Vida. Thanks, Pearl. Susie, are you there? Hi. Hi, Hi. Susie. Hi, Isabel. Hi, good evening. Uh, good evening, everybody. And my name is Susie. I'm currently working in Summer Hospital as a IPD specialist. I have been working in this hospital for the last one and a half years, and uh, I'm very happy to be here today with you, and uh, thank you for joining us this evening. So you're in leafy North London, aren't you, Susie? Yeah, North West London. Leafy North West London, lovely. Um, Cara, you there? I'm here, hi. Hi, so, Cara. Uh, Hi, I'm Cara. Um, I'm a Crohn's and Colitis uh, nurse specialist at Scunthorpe Hospital, which is a little town in North Lincolnshire. Not so little, is it? No, it is littleish. You're our northern representative, Cara. It's lovely to I see am. you. Yeah. And you've probably got your badge on, which gives you brownie points. I have. <laughs> <laughs> Kay, Kay, are you there? I am. Kay, introduce yourself. Hi, I'm Kay Griefson. I'm a lead inflammatory bowel disease nurse at Royal Free Hospital in London. So we know each other, don't we? We do. <laughs> we do. Well, we all know each other, but I know you particularly well. Kay, nice to have you. And then last of all, but really importantly, Mary. Mary, are you there? Yes, I'm here, Isabel. Thanks. I'm Mary Brennan. I'm clinical nurse specialist for paediatric inflammatory bowel disease at Addenbrooke's Hospital in Cambridge. Well, there you go. So we've got our paediatric nurse specialist tonight, which may prompt you to give us different questions. Mary's here to help. Um, we are all English today. Um, that's just through availability. You can imagine at the moment, life is pretty busy for everybody. Um, but we are all English, but we are widely spread geographically. There may be some faces that some of you recon recognise or some names that you recognise. So um, we'll tell you all about ourselves as we go through. I'm going to start with a question. I think maybe I'm going to give this to Kay first. Kay, can you just talk a little bit about what your experience of the NHS over the last few weeks has been? Yeah, I mean, understandably, it's, you know, it's been really hectic. Things have pretty much been turned on their head, to be honest. It's all about kind of trying to find new ways of working and new ways that we can support patients and manage the IBD service with the least disruption as possible. Yeah. It's been difficult with members of the team, you know, some are working remotely, some are 
working on intensive care or on other wards, not doing their IBD jobs. So, you know, it's been kind of very disjointed, not working with the usual team members and just really just trying to find different ways of working and trying to reassure patients as well that, that things are still, you know, that they can still access care, but it just might be in a slightly different way to, their use, to what they used to. Do you think it's changed your relationship with the people that you care for the last few weeks? Um, yeah, I think it has. I think that a lot of um, people with Crohn's disease and ulcerative colitis who, you know, we, we, at the start we were getting a lot of phone calls and a lot of emails from understandably anxious patients. Um, but I think now we're starting to see a bit of a decline in the emails. Um, so yeah, I, th I think it has changed the relationship a little bit. I think, you know, patients are maybe a little bit more understanding of the role that we do yeah. um, and the work that we've, that we've got to do, you know, and the fact that we are still running the service despite everything that's going on. And I have to say, because you and I work together, don't we? But our nursing team have been amazing, haven't they? Yeah. Just the individuals. I could shout out to Alex and Amy and, you know, they've just been amazing in terms of how they, they've adjusted to it as well. Yes, definitely. Yeah, it's worth celebrating today a bit, I think. Now, Mary, are you there? I just wanted to get a sense from paediatrics. Um, how, how have things been for you, Mary, over the last few weeks? I think as Kay said, it's been quite challenging in the different working ways. And for me, I've struggled with the whole change. Even this zooming into a meeting has been a huge <laughs> learning curve for me. But the important thing has been keeping going to work, trying to follow the policies, keeping the patients safe, making sure that there was policies and procedures in place to yeah. make sure that those patients were yeah. safe when they had to come into hospital that they could feel reassured yeah. when they had to come into hospital the advice line in the first few days went absolutely crazy um, in pediatrics in general the ways have changed in terms of the ward we had people divided up into age but it had to change into a green ward and a red ward so that we were avoiding cross-contamination of patients with COVID and non-COVID patients yeah. On the whole, the infusions have continued as normal. Patients have come in and um, we've done more rapid infusions than we have been doing. So patients who previously would have still done them over two hours, we have brought them down to an hour. We've been letting them go home a bit more quickly, which because the change happened so quickly, it invoked a bit of anxiety in the beginning. But now that we're nearly into our eighth week, because the patients that I saw at the beginning of this are now the patients that are coming back again. And um, there's more work involved in terms of any patients we're having to admit for overnight stays. It's getting them swapped before they come in. And um, we've had yeah. no endoscopy lists. People are really worried about coming into hospital, aren't they? And, and fairly. What, what, do you, what do you say to relieve those worries? I think it's reassuring them that everybody is wearing the protective equipment to make sure that the patients are safe not to leave it too late that if they are concerned to get help early on to mm. seek advice and guidance um washing your hands is really important um re-explaining all the things like only one parent is now allowed to accompany a child onto the ward um and just to ask if they're unsure if they're uncertain yeah. about anything yeah. and be honest about their anxiety and let us know so that we can try to help to alleviate some of that yeah, it's one of the most important parts of our roles, isn't it, as nurse specialists, is to, is to really listen and hear worries and answer those, and help people to deal with those worries. Yeah, good. Absolutely. Thank you both. On a wider, we move away from the joys of COVID. Um, obviously, it's International Nurses Day today. You have all chosen to work with people with Crohn's and colitis. Perhaps start with Pearl. Pearl. What was it about Crohn's and colitis care that attracted you, that made you want to work in this specialty? Have we got Pearl? There we go. There you go. Yeah, can beautifully. Um, so I, um, 
I remember saying in my application to the programme, to the Crohn's Colitis Nurse Specialist Programme, that I didn't really set out my, in my nursing career to become an inflammatory bowel disease nurse. But once I um, started to understand about Crohn's and colitis, um, I sort of realised that patients didn't choose their path either. And if I could make their, make people's um, journey with inflammatory bowel disease just a small bit better, by being there, by being supportive, by, by being able to answer their queries and questions, then, um, then when, when then I'm happy, I'm happy in my career. And I think it's a, um, it, it's a hidden illness. It's a, a, a disease that I think is un, underfunded, unsung, and, and <clears throat> I feel passionately that, um, that people with Crohn's and colitis deserve people with, loud voices and um, <laughs> big banners to say <laughs> it was care possible um and i yeah so that's why and, and, and we can be quite loud as a bunch can't we we can I've, I've heard you i've heard you put your voice across and often we represent the patient's voice quite a lot don't we off that's exactly it being an advocate for patients is is everything sometimes you know, I, I've even recently got get myself into trouble because I'm such a, a, a loud patient advocate. So um, I will always put myself between um, patients and, and adversity if I can. Oh, that's excellent. Um, Susie, you, you're newer to, the, newer to it, I think. What yeah. made you decide to work in, in Crohn's and Colitis Care? Hi, Isabel. Yes, I'm pretty new uh, to uh, IBD specialism. Um, my uh, IBD nurse specialist role started about three years ago. Um, I remember it was in April 2017, and uh, I was uh, introduced by one of my colleagues to attend event for uh, nurses who wanted to be uh, IBD nurse specialist. So uh, that event was organized by yourself and uh, I felt that event was organized so well and it so um, it inspired me and I was drawn into it immediately and uh, then after that um, I was looking for the IBD nurse specialist job. Uh, before before that, I was doing uh, research nurse uh, for a few years uh, on biologics for uh, IBD patients. Um, and uh, after six months uh, uh, post that event, and I find uh, IBD nurse specialist job. And uh, Susie, you've done us a great you've done us a great service. So you're advertising a bit, but thank you because part of the Crohn's and Colitis UK's work is finding nurses to come into this specialty, isn't it? You know, there's shortages of nurses everywhere, and we want them in IBD when they're good. And you came through a program that we ran to try and find the nurses of the future. So it's really nice. I'm really proud to see you here. Thanks. Thank you. Um, Cara. What is it about looking after people with Crohn's and colitis do you think that's particularly special for you? For me, it's the most rewarding job. Um, you build up this unique relationship with the patient and it, it really is, um, it is a relationship of trust on both sides. Um, I think most nurses come into the role because they want to help people. Um, and in this role, with caring for patients with Crohn's um, and ulcerative colitis, you really have the chance to make a difference to their mm. to their lives and their quality of lives. Yeah. Um, and there's nothing more rewarding than that. Um, I, I finish work every day feeling like I've really achieved something, even on the worst days. You know, the yeah. most horriblest of days. You, you come home and you really feel like you've helped people, and that to me is um, well, that's that's your, your job satisfaction. Yeah, thanks. Vida, have you got anything to add about what it is about Crohn's and colitis that's really a special area for us to work in? Yeah, I absolutely echo what Cara's just said. Um, these are conditions that affect all ages, all walks of life. Um, and I've met so many different people. Uh, and being able to support somebody to uh, prosper at university or start a family and um, be productive at work or just simply you know, go on their 
well-deserved holiday um, it, it feels like a real privilege um, and, it, and it is absolutely rewarding um, and over the years I've seen some incredible advances in Crohn's and colitis care and firsthand seeing the difference that an effective IBD team or an individual can make on the course of someone's life is I think it's really motivating it motivates motivates me to want to do more and do better um, and I've also had the privilege to care for some truly inspiring people who've overcome so much and inspired so many um, and I guess like um, on a daily basis I'm kind of humbled by people's resilience how resilient they are and that really inspires me as well and um, that's what makes yeah. it special for me. That's yeah. enough that's enough now because you're making me emotional. <laughs> <laughs> Well, I'm gonna I'm gonna grab you for a minute. Um, one of the biggest questions, and the comms team have asked me to bring it up earlier on, and we were gonna is about is about shielding. And one of the biggest things we're getting on our advice lines, and all nurses, IBD nurse specialists, run advice lines, either phone or email or a combination where they can get hold of us. Um, really, in the light of the current the current situation with shielding. Um, what, what advice should we be giving in terms of, you know, how we manage our phones and how we manage the contacts that we're getting? Um, I think, you know, we have to think about in the context of, of prioritisation, I think anxiety over what you should be doing sometimes trumps everything. So yeah. the advice line um, is there to, to hopefully help answer some of those questions. I mean, obviously, there's also the Crohn's and um, support line as well which I think can help in many ways so if you're struggling perhaps to get a hold of your usual um, service they, they can certainly help and there's lots of online support as well but the advice line um, is playing a, a different role but, but a role that's always been there as well because I think we, we will all have come across little um, what should we say should we say there's something that's been in the media that has um, been on the television or in the Daily Mail and we've all had to deal with those specific queries and it's one of the things that, that drove me onto social media was to start just checking what patients were seeing because I was hearing so much of it coming through that I felt like I needed to catch up um, myself really so that I could help support them on the advice line um, and I think that's what we're, we're having to do now really catch up with the what's being said. I think it's really, really important to say, isn't it, that um, people really need to identify which group they're in, in terms of their vulnerability of COVID. And uh, nurses can help you, but the information on the Crohn's and Colitis UK website, there's a decision tree that people can go and look at to see how much risk they're at and whether they're in the high risk group that means that they need to shield. Um, Kay, I'm putting this out, we weren't going to talk about this earlier, but Kay, what does shielding mean for people? What's the implications of shielding for people who are at a high risk? I mean, if people are at high risk and are shielding, then right now they do still need to continue shielding. Um, there's been a lot of questions on the advice line regarding, well, what happens if somebody in your house needs or wants to go back to work, but yeah. they're shielding? And, and that's a really popular question that's come up. Um, I think the main thing is that and the guidance does say that they should go back to work if they want to, but then they just need to follow government guidelines, keep with the enhanced kind of kind of social distancing, make sure that they're wear a mask when they're out, when they come back in at home, wash their clothes, wash or clean down with detergent or antiseptic, any keys or things that they've been using during their work. Um, and just make sure to wash your hands, obviously, which is a big one to make sure they do that. So it's just making sure that they keep with the cleanliness and the government guidelines. Um, there is obviously a, some guidelines that say that even when they're in the house, that if somebody who's been out to work is in the house with somebody who's shielding, there still has to be some element of social distancing there, even though they're a household contact. Yeah. Um, I know it's difficult. It's not always easy, especially if you've got young children and things like that. It's, it's easier said than done. 
but the key thing is that people can still go out to work even if they live with somebody who is shielding okay and of course I, I have to say now we're, we're all talking from an English perspective and there may be people um watching from Northern Ireland Scotland and Wales where the messaging um over the last few days is different and they're all still in the stay home um the stay home poop um situation but certainly um that that shielding is not easy it's really important that you make sure that you know that you're doing the right thing in the right category and go to the website find out which category you're in and look at the information there's so much there for you about about what the implications are guys i'm moving to the questions because apparently there's loads of questions coming in cara can i ask this is something someone asked yesterday what should people do if for some reason their appointment or their infusion date or something they're expected at the hospital is cancelled what advice would you give i think first off is just to stay calm and not to panic about it um with to, with infusions we are uh, trying to give them where we can um there is some time to play with between the due dates um, and when we would could get you booked in for your infusion um but the, the main thing is to just to stay calm if you do have any symptoms and flares then contact your IBD team as you normally would um, and just remember if a decision has been made to cancel your infusion it will be for a good reason and it wouldn't be made lightly and um, the team will all be uh, watching out for you and actually it, it's important to say isn't it that if there is a delay of a few weeks by an appointment or an infusion that's not critical, is it? That the advice yeah. from the British Society of Gastroenterology, which is the body that oversee us, says that that's okay, isn't it? Yes, yeah, they, they do. They reassure us that um, there would be no clinical harm from doing that. Yeah, yeah. Um, Fida, a lot of us now are, are using what we would call virtual appointments. So we're managing people without bringing them to the hospital. Can you just say a little bit about what virtual appointments might mean and how they work? Um, yeah, absolutely. So it, it's really not that dissimilar to what we do as IBD nurses, managing the helpline, uh, where we're doing a lot of assessment of patients over the phone. And um, so it's not a, a huge leap for us to, to do this, but it basically it's meaning that all face-to-face -face appointments uh, we're trying to give um, uh, over the phone. I know some trusts are moving towards doing video consultations as well. I think we will be trying to move towards giving patients a choice. So whether they want to video conference or telephone. And of course, I think it's really important to remind people that if they're sick and they need to be seen, we will still um, yeah. see them. And I think that's really important. Yeah, um, the, the, I'm gonna bring you into a question I was gonna bring later, but if they can't get hold of the team, if people are struggling and they're not well, what, what's the important advice for them about that? Absolutely. If you're struggling and you need to be seen um, and you can't get hold of your team, then you go through your normal channels of bringing your GP out of our service or ultimately bring yourself to the emergency department if you're really yeah. sick. Yeah, don't, don't sit at home and get unwell. No. They're open to everybody, isn't it? Mary, there are lots of questions coming in about paediatrics and children. Um, what are the best messages you can give or do you give to your patients about how to support their children in this time? I think in terms of supporting children, being honest with them and explaining to them the situation that's going on using age appropriate language. So if your child is younger, make sure that you keep the explanation quite simple. As they get older, making sure they understand the importance of washing their hands. Um, and as a team, we're very lucky in the fact that we've got um, our psychologists who aren't seeing patients face to face at the moment, but they are very helpful in supporting us as the nurse is giving advice to families. And their three key principles really are um, given the structure to the day. So trying to keep routine, trying to keep a bedtime. It's not like they're on holidays. They should still be doing some schoolwork, I'm afraid. And I'm sure. Oh, so they am very good at that. <laughs> I know it's all very hard. So they should have um, something that they can achieve, and that could be a bit of schoolwork that they've been set, that they've managed to complete. Some fun, so obviously get out there and do some playing or playing within the house, and um, making sure that they get some exercise, 
as well as making sure that they have a healthy, well-balanced diet throughout this, but try to keep routine. So if I, if I run in my head, my kids are a bit bigger these days, but, but there's something about keeping structure and, and communicating clearly. Is that what you mean? Absolutely, yes. And, and giving those messages, because often the messages that we hear about COVID and illness are quite frightening. How do you give that in a way that isn't going to frighten a child? As you said, Isabel, that's very difficult because things do yeah. change so much. I think so many adults are frightened themselves. I think it's keeping in check that frightenedness. I think it's seeking help and advice where necessary. There is loads of apps, there's loads of links um, with storybooks, for example, and stories as to how to explain this to children. And okay. um, I know the schools for some of the children has been brilliant with giving suggestions. Young Minds, for example, is very good for young people who have mental health issues and have, have anxieties. Um, and ultimately for the children with Crohn's and colitis, it is about coming back to us because we're there to help with holistic care and anxiety and explain this current very uncertain situation. We will do our best to try to help. Okay. No, that's really helpful. Quick message to the comms team. Can comms, can you put the questions onto my WhatsApp just so I've got them? That'd be great. Um, Pearl, one of the biggest things, you know, we all we're all finding it stressful. Um, people are struggling at times, whether it's about their anxieties, about their their physical health and the impact it's having on their mental health. What advice can we give to help? keep people to keep their mental health safe at the minute? I think it's um, really important. Um, one of my colleagues, Vida, said earlier on just to say, you know, if you, if you are um, struggling, then reach out and, and thank you to whoever asked these questions because it's not easy to say you're struggling um, at any time. And at this time, I just think it's um, unprecedented. I it, It's the anxieties about your health which then probably feed into your mental health need addressing so the best thing to do is reach out whatever that may be now there's obviously support on the Crohn's and Colitis UK website there's the advice lines um not one of the things I just want to point out is that obviously services are varied across the country and across the four nations some people aren't able to um, still maintain a full service for, for various reasons because of the way hospitals have had to just completely reconfigure their yeah. whole working um, setup. So if you can't get hold of your usual team, make sure you find out locally what other services there are. So there's steps to well-being um, in our area. I'm sure there's something similar in other areas where you can actually self-refer for pretty much immediate advice and they um, can be I've actually used them myself quite honestly recently and they've been fantastic great help so um and that somebody told me actually that they're, they're they're crying out for people now that where they were very busy they're not so busy at the moment so um those sorts of services are great so as well as reaching out to that just make sure you stay in contact with family and friends if you've got them it's really important i've seen some lovely um, pictures of Zoom parties and, um, you know, quizzes and various other things. They all look great fun. Um, so, yeah, it's um, we've been keeping a little family house party group going so that, you know, even though my daughter lives only just up the road from me, I've only seen her from, the, from a distance for the last nine weeks. So I think it's that social contact we're missing. So just, you know, try and keep that going. And um, you know, social media has its place. Use it wisely, I always say. Um, make sure you're, you're talking to the right people that are giving you the positive message. You don't necessarily want to feed each other's um, <sighs> unhappiness or worry. So, Beda, have you got anything you want to add about mental health? Um, yeah, no, absolutely. I think it's so important to ask this question and not, not struggle on alone um, and I think that if you can't get hold of your IBD team and we we would always welcome people to talk about their mental and emotional well-being with us um, but don't forget your GPs as well if you're really worried they really know their stuff when it comes to managing these kinds of things yeah. um, and there's some super resources out there Crohn's and Colitis UK have some fantastic links on there to help with your emotional and mental well-being 
and of course organizations like Mind as well um, who have some really simple to use tools that you can go on there and even if you feel you might need urgent help it can signpost you to to where to go and who to call um, but yeah ask ask for help yeah Mary, one for you. Um, this is a question from somebody who says they're at moderate or high risk in terms of their vulnerability. If schools stay open, can they can they um send is it safe to send their children back to school when they're at home shielding? I think this is a bit similar to a question earlier about work colleagues going back to school it is about following the government guidance if the child goes out to school it's making sure that when they come home they wash their hands the surfaces are cleaned down and um, that they are protecting the adult who has to shield or to be protected from covid um, coming yeah. from an adult perspective it's a little bit more difficult for me because of, obviously I always think about the child, but having said that, we did have a parent recently who was in um, protective isolation herself and her child had to come for her infusion. Um, so it was about supporting her in being able to come safely for that infusion, um, which again is just good. Sorry, Susie, can you mute? Yeah, sorry. Okay. Thanks, Mary. Is there something about asking um, asking the school or talking to schools? I think absolutely. Um, informing school, as well as asking for advice, making sure that they're aware of the patient, the parent situation or the adult situation. Okay. I think it's really important to open communication with them. I've got some questions coming through now. Um, I'm going to ask this one. Um, I think, Cara, see if you can help me with this one. Uh, it says, I'm currently strict social distancing. So this is somebody who's at moderate risk. They're not shielding, but they're being really strict in terms of social distancing. Should they got a call today to return to work and they're really not comfortable about it? What, what advice should we give about returning to work? Cara, you there? Yeah, I'm here. I think um, they need to have an honest conversation with their employer. Um, they need to see if their employer's um, implementing the social distancing guidelines for stringent social distancing in the workplace. Um, and if they're not comfortable, they need to work that out um, with that conversation and decide if they can come to some sort of agreement. Yeah, there's, there's very clear information, well, certainly clear information for employers, aren't there, about, about making workplaces safe for people. Yeah. Um, and it's about being open and honest, isn't it? Absolutely, yeah, it's about being open and honest. And work, you have to, they have to work together um, to yeah. make an agreement because this is all uncharted uh, uh, waters for everybody. Yeah. yeah. Just, just a little comment about that. I, I uh, saw a um, interesting piece on the news this morning about um, if you do come across problems with your employer now, it's really important to make sure you document everything. Because things like employment tribunals aren't going to be running at the moment. So if you do run into further problems that you need to address later on, all your documentation, that's, you know, that's worst case scenario and hopefully you won't need that. But, but you have to protect yourself because not all employers are good employers. We know that. No, 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 true. And again, go back to the Crohn's and Colitis UK website. There's really good information, which I know I've used and signposted people to, to print off or signpost their employer to, to really educate them. It's really important. Mm -hmm. Question for Mary. Mary, if schools reopen on the 1st of June and you have a child with Crohn's or colitis, is it safe to send them back to school? Again, it depends on the guidance that's put in, in terms of social distancing, two meters, washing hands. I think it also depends on the risk. I think for the children that are shielding, it's probably going to be much later when they get back. Right. I think the age of the child, um, if you've got five, six year old, it's going to be quite difficult. They haven't seen their friends for such a long time to ensure that that enhanced social distancing is still Take it, carried out. So I think it's a question of liaison between schools, ourselves. Um, yeah. And ask ask the questions in advance, really. Do you think get in touch with the school now? Having
having spoken to some parents who are teachers, I think it's a bit difficult even for the schools to answer right now. They haven't got the clear guidance as to what's going to happen. And okay. I think a bit, it's a bit of a moving feast in the same ways as for ourselves over the last couple of weeks. Things have changed in the space of 24 hours. You know, if the classes are going to be classes of 15, but then how do you decide which children go back? And yes. I would imagine that schools will be use their common sense and they will get the children with no medical conditions or the lowest risk patients back or children back first and then right. probably re gradually reintroduce everybody and yeah. um, at least that's the way I'd like to envisage for myself that that's the way it should work and speaking to some parents it definitely would seem to be the ways that they are currently thinking. And well, most schools know already who their children are who are in moderate or high risk groups. Will they know that or is that still something that's going to work itself out as this conversation happens? For some of the schools, they will know. For example, we've had five children in the last seven weeks diagnosed with um, either Crohn's or ulcerative colitis. And um, so unfortunately for them, no, they are not going to know what's going on. And um, so it will be important for those parents to be getting in touch. And I know that some of the parents already have written to the schools and let them know what's happening. Yeah. And um, obviously some of them will have had their letters. Certainly um, our group of patients for the high risk patients, they will have had their letters and schools are currently open. So I suppose they could start those sort of conversations with school. Yeah. Um, and although school may not be able to give clear guidance in what's expected, at least when they're doing the risk assessments, they can include that information in it. Yeah, yeah. It's really about communication and talking, isn't it? Absolutely. And keeping those lines of communication open, it sounds like. Uh, Gosh, it's difficult though, isn't it? Um, Kay, um, can I ask that there are lots of people asking about shielding as adults, when they're shielding for 12 weeks, what's, what do we think is going to happen at the end of 12 weeks? Um, and, and the other question is, can they change categories? Can people move from being high risk to being moderate risk, for example? Yeah, it's a good question. I think people can move from being high risk to moderate risk. For example, if they in, are in high risk because they're taking a high dose of steroids, for example. Okay. So if you take 20 milligrams of, or more of corticosteroids, you're in high risk. When you drop below that, you then will go into moderate risk because you're still on steroids, but you're not on the high dose. Okay. Same with any patients who may have started biologic induction in the last six weeks. They would be in the high risk category, but then after that six week period, they could drop down into the moderate risk. Um, they're the things off the top of my head that I can think how yes. people might move between. So it's quite important, isn't it, for people to keep checking that decision tree on the website. Because yeah. what you do, and you can just look at all your risk factors as they change week by week, day by day, and see if your risk category changes. Yes. Yeah. And in terms of the 12 weeks, I think they've just announced, haven't they, that the shielding is now carrying on into June. Um, and, and I'm guessing it's the government that are going to tell us how long we need to shield, isn't it? It is. I mean, I think from the initial guidance the shielding of the 12 weeks started from when they first announced it so i think the original shielding would have been something like the middle of june because okay. that will be 12 weeks from when they first announced it i guess if they're going to extend it by another couple of weeks then it will be that but i think the original one was always going to be around the middle of june time okay can I just want to say one of the things that, um, again, about a changing of treatment, I mean, obviously things like Kay's just pointed out, like coming off of your induction doses and, and, and reducing courses of steroids is fine, but I think it's really, really important just to stress how important it is for you to stay well in yes. your IBD. So don't make any rash decisions about changing your treatment just to change your risk category, because yes. that could be catastrophic for you. Yes. Um, so, so There's a really big message, isn't there, about that being well is really important, more important almost than any of the medication that you're on, but also mm -hmm. that that we must never up or down the stronger medications, particularly anything yeah. if you're using home biologics or you're on Im immunomodulators, tablets like azathioprine, things like that, don't change um, uh, because you think it's going to make you safer. 
what information we have got about COVID at the moment, sorry, Kay, what information we have got about COVID at the moment in, in inflammatory bowel disease is that um, the best outcomes are when you're well. So, and, yes. and actually the treatments that you're on are actually still fairly low risk from what we know. That's limited information, but, it's, but it is positive yeah. um, for staying hey, well. Kay, did you want to say something? Yeah, so there's also um, a question that I get asked quite a lot is, or, or that I've come across in patients that I've spoken to, is that they have automatically stopped medications such as azathioprine or mecaptopurine without speaking to their IBD team because they were worried about the COVID. Right. And the key thing with that is that actually it doesn't really make any difference on on the risk because the medication stays in your body for a certain amount of time anyway so the drug will be in your body for at least six weeks after you stop it so stopping it as a jerk reaction because you are worried that you may contract covid isn't the right thing to do and then you know there's a risk then of you getting a flare up within that period then you may end up on steroids which is even worse so you know it's all about t talking and assessing the risk really and that's why it's important to look on the Crohn's and Colitis UK website because they have a lot of frequently asked questions but also try and contact your IVD team if you're concerned rather than stopping medication of your own accord. Yeah thanks. Theda can I feed a question to you? Um, this one says um, we have a hospital appointment to attend on Thursday my partner has non-active Crohn's disease and has been told to, in, to advance social distance. Should they take any measures going to the hospital? Should they wear masks for their hospital appointment and will it be safe for them to go? Um, I think if they're well, do they need to go um, yeah. to the hospital appointment is the key thing. And, uh, uh, you know, you should only really be going to attend in the hospital if you absolutely have to because you're sick or you're needing to attend for an infusion, in which case they've many trusts have been able to put things in place to make their, their infusion units um, uh, kind of cold sites, as they call them, where they're trying to reduce the risk of um, uh, coming into contact with COVID. So I think the key thing is if you've got your face-to-face -face appointment booked, it might be worthwhile just ringing and checking, actually, can that be changed to a telephone consultation? Yeah. And if you're well, actually, can it be postponed? Yeah, people worry though, don't they, that they need to have monitoring, you know, maybe it may be that they have a three monthly blood test or they have a six monthly appointment and that whilst they're well, this is routine. Does it matter that they postpone routine things for a little while? Um, I think if you're well, um, that in most cases you can probably postpone. I think when it comes to monitoring your uh, the drugs that you're on, it depends on the drug that you're on. And I think that's just worth checking with your IBD team um, okay. uh, when you can, and if when you can postpone that. Okay. Susie, can I, I can ask to see you back. Can I just ask you, when people with IBD who need to come to hospital with Crohn's and colitis, what mm -hmm. do we do or what are you doing in the hospital to keep them safe and to keep protect them when they come in? Um, so for our hospital, for my service, IBD service in St. Mark Hospital, uh, all the face-to-face uh, -face clinic has been converted to the telephone clinics during this pandem uh, pandemic period. And uh, we keep the uh, biologic infusions going. Uh, obviously, there are a small number of patients that cancelled uh, their biologic infusion because of the worry things. And uh, we had the records of them and keep monitoring how they, how they, uh, you know, how they're going to uh, progress, um, you know, in the future. We got that records. And also when people coming to our day unit having the IBD biologic um, infusion, uh, we have um, our staff have a PPE, uh, we have guns, we have uh, uh, gloves and we have masks, we have uh, goggles and uh, also we provide masks for our patients as well when they come uh, to us have an infusion and we ask them to uh, do a really good hand hygiene when they come into the unit, do yeah. the good uh, hand washing with soap and water um, yeah. and also we don't encourage uh, patients come with um, more than one uh, family member 
and the family member, they can wait outside of the infusion unit to protect our patients and our staff as well. And yeah. also for the blood monitoring, um, for patients on the immunosuppressant uh, and uh, subcardiologics. So normally we do three monthly blood monitoring, but because of the pandemic period, uh, we have a discussion within our trust. And at the moment, if patient has been stable, um, you know, their blood has been stable in the last uh, three months, uh, we extend our blood monitoring to six months. Yeah, um, yeah. And, um, I think that's true, isn't it? And, and that's actually in the national guidance, isn't it? That, that actually, if you miss one blood test, it, it probably isn't too much of a problem. Thanks, Susie. Yeah, no problem. Um, Cara, one question. What should people do who are in moderate risk groups who work with children and babies, for example, a teacher or an early years carer? Um, what advice should we be giving them if they're in the moderate risk group? I think if they can adhere by the um, guidelines for the moderate risk group for the social distancing through their yeah. job, then they need to be speaking to their employer. Is there another role that they can do within um, the school where they don't actually have to have contact with the children in the early years that uh, you're not going to be able to commute us from all the time? Um, yeah. And again, it's just about communication and trying to work out a plan between um, you both. Yeah. Thank you, everybody. We've done brilliantly on our questions. Um, I, I suppose I just want to finish International Nurses Day. If I could just go around you all really quickly, what is it that you would say for you as individuals? It might be a chance for you to shout out your wonderness um, that you really think that you're proud of and you'd like to really share with everyone on this on this celebratory day. Fida, anything you're proud of that you want to share? Um. I want to give a shout out to my team in Exeter. I'm so proud of them and what they've oh. achieved um, over, well, always, but especially recently, um, how they've teamed up with other services, redesigned the service, um, stepped out of their comfort zones, um, uh, and all the while, you know, still with a smile on their faces. I think they're dedicated, wonderful, wonderful people. I'm very, very lucky. Brilliant. Peter, that's lovely. Pearl? I just um I always say I'm proud to be a nurse mainly because of all the other wonderful nurses that I've, I've come across I think um you know there's people that have inspired you along the way many of you are already here you you know every IBD nurse I've ever come across seems to be passionate infested um so nurses who look after people with Crohn's and colitis seem to be I don't know just that bit more special I think I've Definitely. never worked with people like like you also dedicated none of us are more dedicated than the other we're all just passionate and invested and yeah it's lovely yeah. you inspire me every day cara yeah i think it, it's the same being part of that community of nurses um and like echoing what pearl has just said about inspiring each other yeah susie you want to add anything hi um I wanted to say I'm really proud to be part of the team at St. Mark Hospital, uh, especially during this uh, very difficult time, because our service is one of the biggest uh, IBD centers in the country. The demand is very, very high, and uh, we still put it through during this difficult time. I'm so proud, and I've, everybody has been working so hard during this time. But, however, I'm appreciated for the patients as well. We always get appreciation from the patients, so thank you as well. Oh, that's nice. Kay? I'm kind of well after watching the documentary yesterday on BBC Two, the hospital. Um, you know, really proud of. I was proud of working at the Royal Free before then, but I'm even more proud of working there now, yeah. and just being part of an amazing team and really inspiring people. And I guess another thing which kind of a, many will know about is just developing the IBD Passport Charity, which I did. That's just one thing that I'm kind of particularly proud of from a professional kind of personal point of view but just you know more just working in an amazing supportive team and a great hospital okay get the plug in again because it's really important it's called ibd passport isn't it it is ibd passport yeah. all, all, your, all your hard work amazing mary mary would you like to say anything 
I would. I think that one of the things I'm most proud of is the families and young people that I look after, the parents, how they support the young people who take on this diagnosis and the majority of them who come out as very inspirational young people who achieve fantastic careers. Some who have contacted me after five, six, seven years to let me know what they're doing. And I think they're just amazing. But also the team that I work with, not just the team of nurses, because I, as gastroenterology yeah, for paediatrics, we're a mixture of teams. So there, I work with various specialities in the office. They are amazing nurses, but also our MDT. They are fantastic. The doctors, psychologists, dietitians, any of them are just absolutely fantastic. And I'm just so proud to be part of that team and proud to be a nurse. Brilliant. I'm going to finish with something because I haven't really said that you guys are all Crohn's and Colitis UK nurse specialists. You're all in our programme. You're five of 15 amazing nurses across the UK who are working directly with us in the charity. And in return, we're supporting, helping you develop and helping you with your academic studies. And you know, the charity has really invested in the programme, hasn't it? It's made a massive difference to us all. Yeah, definitely. Absolutely. Yeah. Yay. Big up. <laughs> now, I'm going to finish off just to say um, this will stay on the charity's Facebook page and YouTube for a while. So do access it. Uh, I think we would all echo widely how important Crohn's and Colitis UK is to us as healthcare professionals, mm. but how fantastic their investment in nursing has been, particularly through the Crohn's and Colitis UK programme. So for all of you at home um, who are watching in, if you want to donate either with cash or through your memberships, really the charity needs all your support. So please join us in supporting the charity too. Thank you girls, everybody, for a really an excellent session. I'm gonna wave and say, happy nursing day all. Happy nursing day. Happy nursing day.